delighted to be able to welcome two people that we have with us this, this morning on the main stage, two dynamic change makers who work at the intersection of science, policy, and communities, and whose work has has had and continues to have influence globally and right here in their home countries of Rwanda. Uh, Ms. Adeline Chizuso is a trained water resources engineer who has turned her passion and talents to global awareness raising around climate change. And specifically, she is an advocate for intergenerational equity and a leader in the youth loss and damage, I'm sorry, the loss and damage youth coalition. Um, where she coordinates a very interesting project that we'll hear about this morning, a storytelling project within this coalition. Uh, we'll hear more about that and hear about the perspectives that storytelling offers on evidence gathering and dissemination and use and how it's a compelling methodology. And of course, Professor Romain Morenzi, who's only just arrived <laughs> to be with us here this morning, back from the US, back to your home here in Rwanda. Um, so you've recently returned to academia after a long and distinguished career across different sectors and levels in science advice ecosystems. You were first, um, well, from academia originally here in Rwanda, but then as a minister of science and technology right here, um, you were a key architect of the country's education, science, and technology renaissance as the country rebuilt. And then, until very recently, you were the executive director of TWAS, the Academy of Sciences in the Developing World. Um, Dr. Morenzi has dealt with scientific issues and capacity building for low- and middle-income countries, and most recently, only very recently, back to academia uh, at uh, Worcester University in the U.S., so thank you so much for being with us uh, today for, I suppose, a bit more of a chat around um, some new ideas in uh, science advice and, and new ways of um, using evidence, gathering evidence, but also some reflective ideas. And I think what's, a, what's interesting and important here this morning is that we have these maybe contrasting, maybe complementary perspectives from uh, from the voice of, of, of experience and the voice of youth looking reflectively, looking forward, looking intergenerationally. So I really hope that we can uh, have a dynamic discussion. So the goal of, uh, of our, our discussion, in, in, in addition to bringing these different perspectives into dialogue, is also to really reflect on some of our key themes for this conference, what we mean by transformative change and how we bring that about. Um, some of the issues of um, getting at equitable and inclusive solutions using science, advice, and, and evidence. And most importantly, perhaps talking also about expanding evidence and what new kinds of evidence look like. And Adeline, I know that some of your work touches on that. So maybe that's where I'll start, um, because you bring somewhat of that new perspective um, to INSA, looking at novel ways uh, to approach evidence. Um, and as a global organization um, that unites the, the North and South in the advocacy that you do, the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition has this project around storytelling, which you lead. Um, and from what I understand from the website, it's about collecting and amplifying those stories from frontline communities that are being affected. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you see storytelling as a compelling method um, to collect evidence. What's, what's different about letting people, letting communities tell their own stories um, as uh, climate change is affecting them? What is compelling about that, and how can that complement other ways of gathering evidence? Can you say a few words about that? Yes, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, thank you very much for having me also. Um, before um, I start, Oh, sorry, before I start, I would like to say it's an honor for me to be here with uh, Professor Roma. Um, I was in primary school when Professor Roma was uh, the Minister of Education, so it's really an honor for me to be here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, back to the question. Um, climate change is a global issue, and uh, there's no doubt that it's affecting um, everyone here in the world. 
and uh, the science to, to back that up. We have the scientific data and evidence to, um, to prove that. But when it comes to um, for people to connect with that, to understand it's somehow challenging, and that's, how, and that's where um, stories are really helpful. So with stories, what we try to do is to humanize the science. And in our work, we try to see how can we um, convey important data in a, in a way that people can understand, relate to, and also um, remember, especially. Mm. Um, um, this short story I just shared here, um, I'm sure um, much later, if uh, people ask you what was really interesting about this uh, panel, the first thing that come to mind is how uh, I'm here with Professor Roman two years later. So that's how we try to capture uh, people's attention on the issue and also try to get um, traction on that um, because uh, um, it's really also important in driving actions because uh, to address climate change, we really need uh, a, a behavior change. That's for sure. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I think that's such an important point that um, a good, compelling story helps people uh, not only reflect on but remember ideas, um, take them to heart, I suppose, helps as well in terms of telling a story as opposed to just giving data or evidence. Yes. Um, that's a good lesson for all of us, I think. Romain, I'll turn to you um, in a bit of a reflective mode. Mm -hmm. And um, picking up on Adeline's comments that you were, in fact, minister um, when she was in primary school. So perhaps some of the policies that you had put in place, um, you're seeing come to fruition here on stage today. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you've seen over the years in terms of how priorities in in science systems generally, but in, in, in how science systems can produce advice for governments, how have those priorities changed and, and shaped over time in your experience? Whether you want to talk about at the country level or more globally, because I know you have quite some experience at the global level speaking on behalf of countries in the global mm -hmm. south. So thank you um, for INCSA for this uh, opportunity to uh, to speak at, at this gathering. Um, I'll just ask first, the first question you could ask, why science advice? Mm -hmm. Why do we consider science as important uh, for a government to really uh, need a science advice? Not only even, even for government, for uh, regional organizations or economic entities as European Union, African Union, even a global uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, agency such as the UN, why do we need a, a, a science advice? Um, governments run on the promise of changing the life of people in the society. They would like to offer education, health, water, electricity, energy, food, uh, infrastructure. But those services, they need uh, resources. You need to have resources in order to be able to, to give to these promises. So for many years, even centuries, Actually, economists wanted to know how do you grow an economy? Because you cannot share what you don't have. You cannot invest in education or give water or support water or infrastructure or build a road if don't, you don't have, you don't grow your economy. So economic growth had become, or even now, is a very important issue to chase. It's a, like some kind of a unicorn. People are, Government are chasing economic growth. Every quarter, the global, um, global North governments actually, they have to say how much economic growth they have done mm. for their, and they run on that. So what is the royal path for economic growth? As they will say in French, uh, 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 Voie royale pour uh, 
uh, the economic growth. So in 1909 to 49, um, uh, in 1956-7, Robert Solow did a very important uh, uh, work, uh, published a very important paper, uh, showing that the, the U.S. economy from 1909 to 1949, most of the growth came from science and technology progress. And that was uh, very important because only around 87, or only 12% came from capital and labor. Mm -hmm. Meaning that investing in a sustained way in science, technology, and innovation, actually you can grow your economy in a sustained way. At the beginning of the 18, 1800s, um, Argentina and the U.S. were at par in terms of economic, same level. But the, the U.S. has become the giant that we know. And if you look uh, in the mid-1850s, you look at the economies in even, even China, even India, in terms of global trade, of course the U.K., mm -hmm. they were better than the U.S. But the U.S. has become what we know because of that. So, 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 so this means that investment in science and technology has become some, some way the royal path. Mm -hmm. So how do you in, do that? And that has made a huge difference in terms of the divide at the global level. You have the global north that you really have advanced in science and technology. You have the global south. In terms of our publication, the global north has more than uh, around 80% of the global publication, mm -hmm. and the global south is 20%. And even in those 20%, the emerging economy, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, they have more than 80% of that. Mm -hmm. In the other countries, Africa, the least developed countries, they have a mere output in terms of science. Mm -hmm. And that has a huge impact. So with that Coming with that reflection, science become a very important issue for countries. Mm -hmm. Any government that really wants to change the life of its people have to invest in science and technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have to have a science and technology policy which for objectives. Knowledge acquisition and deepening. What kind of science in primary school? We talk about the dean, science, primary in college. Because science allows to have critical thinking. Mm -hmm. What kind of science in secondary school, in higher education? Knowledge creation. What kind of research, creation for, for the country? Rwanda is different from, from the US, from China. You have its own society. So this means that there are things that may be of importance for Rwanda, Rwanda could be able to do. And then you have the issue of knowledge transfer. Everything that we do in life has an impact or from science. Even just washing your hands has an impact on the daily life in terms of uh, transmitting disease. We saw that during, during the COVID. You can't talk about building roads, you can't mm -hmm. talk about uh, energy, you can't talk about food without talking about science. You can't even talk about languages without science. And then the whole issue of innovation. Mm -hmm. Innovation is very important. Innovation is not only for, not only for, not for the, the big countries. Innovation can be even for small countries like Rwanda. Mm -hmm. I'm going to finish with just the example of the coffee washing stations. Mm -hmm. Appropriate technologies can have a huge difference in changing life of people. Around 2000, Rwandan coffee and the coffee actually in the East Africa region, in this region, were just sold on the market without washing it with, or without changing anything. And um, a kilo was around one, $0.5. Mm -hmm. But around 2000, the University of Rwanda, um, Michigan State, and Texas uh, and, um, 
they have this project from USAID of uh, coffee washing stations. A coffee washing station is a very known technology. It's a very low level technology. But for the farmers of East Africa, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, in this region, Uganda, it was a new way mm -hmm. of seeing things and doing things. Yeah. Washing the coffee, drying it properly, made the coffee of Rwanda in the region from 0 0.5 to $5, $10 per kilo, but also the coffee being a Starbucks and Costco. Mm -hmm. Changed the life of people. Mm -hmm. So this means that science as we see is not just for space, it's just for people will think about NASA. Uh -uh. Science is for every, every day's life, as we saw also during the COVID. Thank you. And thank you for pointing out also the importance of you know, the multiplicity of priorities within science systems, how they have to touch on so many different sets of priorities, be it economic growth uh, uh, through to innovation that affects families. And of course, that's something that this conference is really trying to build on and think about is what does it mean to expand, uh, be more expansive about the type of evidence that a system can produce, but also about the type of, of evidence that we bring to bear on questions. You know, So your example of, of the, the coffee um, innovation is an interesting one because that required seeing the problem in the first place. And that seeing the problem required understanding of local people's lives and um, how they were affected um, by the, the status quo and then thinking about how it could be improved. So I just want to bring it back to that question of expanding how we get at those questions in the first place. And, and I've got maybe the, the same question for both of you, um, but I'll turn to Adeline first. This idea of you know, looking at a problem, identifying a problem that needs some scientific or innovation input to help solve. We can bring to bear evidence, we can bring to bear expertise, and we can bring to bear lived experience. And, and you've pointed out that your storytelling work brings in that, that lived experience. And, and Romain, thank you for that anecdote or that story about the, the coffee beans, because that too came from understanding people's lives and lived experience that needed innovation. So I'm just wondering, you know, between, between sort of research evidence, scientific expertise, and, and lived experience, three ways of obtaining knowledge, three different types of knowledge, how do you think they might work together to bring to bear on a problem? And in what context might one or another come to the fore? Adeline, do you have some thoughts? Yes, uh, thank you, Christian. So I think... Um, I'm going to have to ask you to speak up just a little sorry, bit. Sorry, sorry. So I think the balance of uh, those three would be in understanding the, the purpose of, the, of each and also the context of the work. So, um, for example, stories can, um, can lead policymakers or the general public to actually to the scientific evidence to understand the issue. And they can also um, propel researchers, um, stories can propel researchers and uh, scientists to, um, to propel the study, to look into the, to the matter. But also, um, at some point, I think the stories um, show the different perspective of communities, which can um, inform policymakers in how to oper operationalize uh, effective solution and also um, maybe um, how to domesticate international um, obligation. Um, I will take an example in our early area of work, loss and damage. For uh, people to actually, people started saying they're affected with loss and damage, and then that's when the science ca came. And now we have uh, a fund and which is operationalized. But now uh, they are looking on how is it going to be uh, oper operationalized. And how is it uh, for it to be, uh, to do what it's meant to do? It has to be um, quick, uh, right after the, the impact. And how is it going to be different from emergency response? And that's why I think we, look, we have to look in the different uh, communities and see how um, it can actually um, work. Thank you. Thank you for that. How about, how about you, Romain, thinking about evidence? expertise and experience in the sense of lived experience from communities. How do, how do those things combine? And maybe are we starting to see their value 
in new ways as we look at more complex problems. Uh, thank you very much. SAS is done for the society. Uh, you, you, you have a society and a community where you want to do, to do the impact. So evidence is important. You need to make sure that um, the community captures that a decision or an activity that, that is you, you want the community to pursue uh, that activity is based on evidence. And that is very important. Uh, the issue of critical thinking that I uh, spoke about earlier in a society is important. Because the advantage of science is it's some kind of science is a kind of, the kind of a, an honest broker. Mm. It puts you the evidence there. You cannot just say, ah, I don't like it. But because if the evidence is there, then it allows, it allows people to say, okay, this decision is right because it's, it's based on the evidence. So having, um, of course, expert in the community who understand the community is very important. Uh, what has happened in the past or in the developing world in general, you will see a lot of consultancies and a lot of expertise coming from abroad, from outside the community, or out of the country, sometimes without capturing actually the experience lived by the society. So understanding the, the society, understanding the culture mm. uh, is very important. If you come in this country here, you need to understand the culture of this country, understand what the country went through. Which and is where those the, stories the, can the really come 1994 in. 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, understand what, what happened. And also, by understanding what happened, you can also understand the drive of the country to move forward. Uh, the country has this culture of uh, Amerwandis, Rwanda, whatever. You, you feel like you want to, to make sure that although we, they went, the country went through issues through the, 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 that genocide against the Tutsi, the country wants to move forward. You cannot just continue to cry. You want to move forward uh, with forward policies that are really based on evidence. It's not just about throwing the the taxpayers, money of the Rwandan people into buying equipment. It is because by, you buy equipment and you train because of this evidence-based work of Robert Solo mm. that we know <laughs> you're gonna, you, you hope the economy is going to grow mm. you know, because you're, you're investing their money, mm. the money of the people. So you need to make sure that if you invest the money of the people, then that money is going to do that. And, and then that is why INSA or SARS policy is important. Mm -hmm. This is why a country has to build a SARS policy. It's not just about having a, a SARS advisor to the government, to the prime minister. No, no, no. It's about building a, a, a SARS advice system based on the country, mm -hmm. being a SARS advice system from academic. Research institutions, university, academics, but also for the people, mm -hmm. from the grassroots up, mm -hmm. in order to be able to, to capture, because it is their money that you are using. So how do you make sure that they understand that? It's a good reminder. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. We've just got about five minutes left, so maybe just a quick comment from you both, taking a, a pretty zoomed out approach, um, because both of you, um, work and have worked in a global space and as advocates in one way or another. So the, the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition advocating for that intergenerational equity, that understanding of impacts of climate change from an evidence-informed um, perspective. And Romain, um, uh, looking back on your work with TWAS, you know, advocating for those strong science systems in the global south as you've described them. So I guess my question uh, and my final question, just in these last five minutes, maybe taking two minutes each, um, taking that zoomed out approach, um, you know, what have you seen? Are, have you seen promising shifts in this 
global struggle for or struggle for global equity in your respective fields. Have you seen, you know, progress happening, Adeline? Um, so I would say um, when you look um, for in, into the climate change space and. Um, uh, let me focus on the climate justice because that's what will help us achieve the, the global equity. So um, climate justice emphasizes the principle of uh, those who contributed less to um, climate change are the one bearing the, the most impact. And um, if, we, if we really want to, um, to address um, the issue, we'll have... Um, you know, those who have contributed the more will have to be a greater responsibility in terms of c carbon emission reduction, um, supporting the communities to rebuild and everything. And um, I would say the, there's still a long way to go if we, fo if we, if co we focus just on that. But I would say the promising shifts are in our own system, in our, in our own countries, where we are trying to find um, sustainable, innovative, homegrown so solution. But there are still challenges, especially um, when resources. Um, professor said that uh, there are different services that require resources. And um, when we talk about resources uh, in climate change, we talk obviously about climate finance. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to fi climate finance, it's one of the things that is still challenging for us, mm -hmm. developing country. And uh, the, um, the challenges is in the accessibility of the climate finance, the quality of the climate finance. We have more loans than uh, grants, which makes us um, more in depth. We have the, the, uh, the balance between adaptation and mitigation. We need more of adaptation. Of course, we need the mitigation, obviously, but we need more of the adaptation. But when we look where most of the climate finance is going, it's not in what, um, what we need. Mm -hmm. So um, in few words, there's, you know, the, the shift it is more from us in finding our own solution, but we still f um, have uh, challenges, with, which is resource. That's a, let's all take note then, the future of science advice with climate finance and how to, how to find those um, appropriate measures and, and probably um, some very science evidence-based ways of calibrating um, those cl climate finance opportunities. Romain, what about you for um, global equity in, in, in science systems and in systems that are able to provide uh, evidence-informed advice to their governments? What would you say about that, that struggle so far? What progress and shifts have we seen in two minutes? <laughs> there are many things one can, can say, but I would like just to say that science is an honest broker in, in that uh, I will just focus on one area, which is science diplomacy. Countries share borders. By sharing borders, they share also resources. Uh, they are what we call shared resources. It could be a river, it could be a basin, it could be like Rwanda, Uganda, and, and Congo. They share the Virunga mountain. The mountain gorilla is, a, is something that is special for the three countries. No matter how the countries may be in, in terms of relationship, the scientists from the three countries in terms of conservation, they have to meet because they have a shared resource and evidence coming from the scientists from the three countries will be in some way being able to fo be followed by one of those. Uh, if you look at the, for example, you can talk about uh, other reg regional shared resources such as the Nile Basin. Mm -hmm. Can you build a dam on it? It's a very hot potato mm -hmm. for, the region, for the region. But we can have also shared resources that we don't capture directly, uh, such as the, the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. which bring in the climate issue. So that is something that we, it's a common that we don't, we, we don't see directly, but that actually affects us. How do you, do you do that? And you can see that uh, uh, science become an honest broker because the, from what the scientists and IPCC came about allows to maybe be able to make decision discussion in what Adeline just, just said a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, science just go beyond just the 
economic growth beyond reducing poverty, but science become actually a tool for diplomacy mm -hmm. and for a relationship between countries. And this is why we are here. When I look in this room, I see Professor Peter Glackman. Uh, I see people who is a science advisor to the Prime Minister of, uh, of New Zealand. And uh, you have Remy Kirion, you have, I don't know if he's here, Vogan Turekian, science advisor, the Secretary of State in the US. You have these people who are here. They, they, this is diplomacy, this is science, it's bring people together so we could solve uh, global, global issues that are of interest for our societies. And those are very helpful words to end on indeed, how science is in, some, in many ways uh, the only common language that we do all share. Um, and um, a helpful uh, reminder of those transboundary, transborder issues that can be brought together through this common language. So thank you so much for joining us. Please join me in thanking our panelists. The voice of experience and the voice of youth. Thank mm -hmm. you.